You guys doing good tonight? Feeling good? Man, you, anybody ever feel like the weekend goes like way too fast? Some of us. Well, guys, I'm excited. I'm excited about these Monday nights. I love these nights. Best night of the week. It's always true. And I'm excited about tonight because, can I tell you why? I'm excited about tonight because I believe that the Lord wants to prove a point. Say he's going to prove a point. I feel like tonight the Lord's going to establish something in your soul that will take you the long, like the long haul. Like he wants to establish something in your soul. He wants your soul to be pierced with grace tonight so that whatever you face in life, you're moving forward. You don't retreat. You don't bow to that thing. You've been marked by grace. Your soul has been touched. And so nothing can sway you from Jesus. You guys down for it? Can I read you our passage of scripture that we're, that we're going through in this series? Who was here last week when we kicked off the series? If you weren't here, I'm going to give you a little bit of a recap. We're in Galatians 5. I'm going to read 10 verses here, okay? Galatians 5, 16 through 26. This is what it says. This is Paul writing. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. Everybody say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, say led by the Spirit. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Paul goes on to say, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, our favorite one from last week, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Bad list. Everybody say bad list. Bad list. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, everybody say but. But, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, say live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Say keep in step with the Spirit. So tonight, we are, we're continuing on in our series on the counterculture. And so over the coming weeks, we're going to be digging in to this list of fruit that Paul lays out in Galatians. But before we jump in, I, I, it's imperative that you and I understand something, is that this list, track with me here, this is, this is key for the whole night. This list is not the fruit of your labor. It's not the fruit of your works. Tonight, we're, we're going after the source of joy. And so you got to understand that joy is not the fruit of your performance. It's not the fruit of your relationships. Joy isn't the fruit of your bank account. Praise God. Can I get a witness in the room? Fruit isn't the, or joy isn't the fruit of your education. You can experience joy in all those things, but all of those things are, they, they change. They're changing. Your relationships can bring you joy, but they can also bring you pain. Your bank account can bring you joy, but come on, it can bring you pain. <laughs> My word, heal us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. But here's the deal. Though you can experience joy in those areas, they are not the source. We're going after the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit at work in you. you got to hear this. It's the Spirit at work in you that produces the fruit. You ever seen like an apple tree like striving to produce fruit? 
You ever see it just like working so hard? Produce an apple, produce an apple, produce an apple. No, that tree's just standing there. If the tree is alive, fruit is the byproduct. If you in this room are a born again believer, that means that the Holy Spirit has set up shop in your body. That means that his life has invaded your frame. You were dead, now you've been made alive. So if you are alive in him, guess what? The byproduct is fruit. Because the spirit is at work in you. Somebody say, the spirit's working in me. So this is why it's, it's key for us as we go in this series that for you and I to, to enjoy this fruit, that's why Paul makes it so clear, you gotta live by the Spirit. You gotta be, what, led by the Spirit. You gotta walk by the Spirit. You gotta keep in step with the Spirit. Basically, attach yourself to the Spirit and stay there. Stay there. Stay with Him. Attach yourself there. So last week, Nick laid out for us um, the works of our flesh and what happens from our fallen nature, those desires, right? Paul says that those desires, they what? They war. They're at war. They're in full opposition to the desires of the Spirit. So that begs the question, what is the desire of the Spirit? Did you know that the Holy Spirit has a strong desire? That he's filled with desire for you, for something to occur inside of you. There's a longing and a yearning in the spirit. And so if you're down for it, we're gonna take that journey tonight and figure out what is that desire. Does that sound good? You guys tracking? I'm gonna pray and we're gonna jump in. Jesus, we love you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and you would bring a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of King Jesus, that tonight our hearts would quake at the beauty at the beauty of King Jesus. Oh, that you would awaken our soul to see him rightly. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would remove every false view of what you're like. Come and reveal Jesus to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So here's the deal. We're jumping in. We're going into this. Tonight we're talking about the source of joy. But you gotta understand something is that our perception, your perception, my perception of God shapes my relationship with him. So your perception, the way you, what you perceive of him, what you perceive he's like, will determine your interaction with him. Not only will it shape your relationship with him, it will shape your life. I've shared this on a Monday night, it was probably six months ago, an old friend and mentor, we were messaging on uh, Facebook Messenger, shout out. And um, anybody else use Facebook, Facebook Messenger? It's just me. He lives international, so that's how we do it. Anyways, we were on Facebook Messenger, messaging back and forth, and we we're talking about some stuff, and he drops his line on me. He says, Zach, if your God is angry, you'll be angry. If your God is angry, You'll be angry. And that just, it kind of haunted me. You know, when somebody drops something on you, you're like, dang, that's like, that, that hit something in there. And so tonight, I want to lay out the proposition and ask you, what if God is actually happy? What are the implications for you and for me and for the world if God actually is not angry, but he's extremely happy? and joyful? What if he's a God that actually enjoys smiling? What if he's the God who smiles? What if right now his disposition towards you wasn't that of disappointment and anger and he's, let, he's, just, he's just so mad and he's frustrated and they can't get it together? What if his disposition towards you tonight is he's beaming with a grin ear to ear because he's just so delighted in you? What are the implications of, for your life if that's true? Does anybody in the room, I know this is me, does anybody in the room really enjoy a good laugh? 
Raise your hand high if you just like, man, if we hang out and we laugh all night, I'm going home and saying, man, that was a good night. That was a good night, man. What'd you guys do? I, I don't, what'd you talk about? I don't know, but we laughed. We laughed. Come on, you know when you meet somebody new and if they're like really funny, you're like, man, I like that guy. I like that girl. She's funny, she makes me laugh. There's something about laughter. There's something about enjoyment, right? There's, you know, like, come on, you know it's, you know it's true. You, you know you feel so accomplished when you make somebody laugh, when you're just on it. And you just got, you got your buddies at the table, they're just cracking up. You just, you leave just walking, just chest out a little bit. Hell, hell, you're like, I did it. Right? It does something to us when we laugh. Well, do you know, the, you know what the scriptures say? It says that you and I, check this out, we were made and created in the image and the likeness of God. So what if your propensity for laughter and joy didn't just happen by happenstance? It wasn't just like, oh, this just happened. But that in God's very nature, at the core of his being, he is a God who loves to laugh. He's a God who's filled with joy. Are you tracking with me? We're going there tonight. He's come telling you, he's proven, he wants to prove a point. He wants to establish something in your soul tonight that's unshakable. We're made in his image. Our propensity for joy comes from him. Check this out, John 20, verse 20. This is Jesus. It says that he, Jesus showed them, his disciples, it's after he's been resurrected, showed him his hands and his side. And it says, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Gladness of heart is the proper response to seeing him rightly. Gladness of heart is the proper response when we see him as he truly is. Come on, he showed him his hands and his side and it says the disciples were glad. Another Translation says that when they saw him with their own eyes, they were exuberant. They were overcome with great joy. When grace strikes our soul, joy is the, is the, product, is the byproduct. There's something about him that awakens in us the purest bliss and joy that there is. It awakens it on the inside when you, when you see him. It's pure, it's perfect, it's untainted. It's, 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 it's the fact that Jesus is actually, check this out, he is the incarnation of joy. He's the embodiment of joy. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.9 that God, your God, has anointed you, Jesus, has anointed him with the oil of gladness beyond his companions. That means that he's more joyful than anyone who's ever existed on the planet. 1 Timothy 1.11, Paul is writing this letter, and he ends this verse by saying, this is in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. Do you know what blessed in the Greek means? Anybody? Happy. You know the Beatitudes, you could trade out blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Happy are the poor in spirit. So 1 Timothy 1.11, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the happy God. Come on, I'm telling you, the Lord's wrestling. He's, he's shifting your paradigm tonight on what he's like. He's the happy God. Let me read to you what John Piper says. We may learn from the phrase, the glory of the happy God, that a great part of God's glory is his happiness. It was inconceivable to the Apostle Paul that God could be denied infinite joy and still be all glorious, meaning he can't be all glorious if he isn't infinitely happy. He used the phrase, the glory of the happy God, because it's a glorious thing for God to be as happy as he is. 
God's glory consists much in the fact that he is happy beyond all our imagination. He's happy beyond all our imagination. So here's the deal. When you and I, when we're born again, when we give our life to Christ, we're all tracking that the Holy Spirit then, right, comes and lives inside. We, we there, we all in agreement that when you're born again, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of you. So you become born again. You become a new creature, new creation, right? Old things pass away, all things are made new. But not only are, does the Holy Spirit come and live in you, but you are placed in Christ. So our born again location, we were in the domain of darkness, Paul says, but we've been translated or transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. We've been relocated into the very life of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. The Trinity, track with me, I know we're getting a little theological, but it's, it's gonna help you. The Father, Son, and the Spirit are not just out there somewhere as some strange theological concept your very life, being born again, you are now sharing in their relationship. You get to share in Jesus' relationship with the Father. Oh, you're not tracking. Listen, listen. You've been brought in. You've been brought in. That's your location by the Spirit right now. Father, Son, Spirit, you. You. You don't become God, you become a participant though, a partaker of that divine life or what C.S. Lewis coined as this divine dance. Oh man, I'm telling you, you're, you're gonna get stirred up tonight. Something's gonna pierce your soul. Check this out, John 17, five. This is Jesus, Father, this is his high priestly prayer in John 17. A lot of red letters in that chapter. It's a good chapter, go read it. Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You gotta pause right there and you'd be like, okay, hold up. Something was happening in the life of God between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit before the world was ever created. There was a glory about them. Something was happening. There was a relationship there and Jesus is saying, Father, I'm about to go to the cross and I'm stoked because of the glory that we had before creation. Oh, here I, I'm coming. I'm coming. Okay, you tracking? So Mark 1, 9 through 11, we get a picture of, it's really, it's an outward picture of the interior life of God. Okay, so think about that. Father, Son, and Spirit, they have this relationship for all of eternity, and so in Mark chapter one, verse nine through 11, we're gonna see a picture of what's been happening inside their relationship forever. You ready to hear what it is? Mark one, nine through 11, it says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens split open, they're torn open, the spirit descends on him like a dove and a voice comes from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. All of a sudden, we see that the spirit comes and embraces the son and clothes him with power. And then the father thunders from heaven his approval of the son as Jesus is just there reflecting back to the father, his love and obedience by being baptized. We're seeing this picture of this shared life, of this radical enjoyment, of this other centeredness, that there is no selfish tendencies in the Trinity. They each orbit around the other. They're constantly giving love and affection and affirmation to the other. There's this joy in this divine dance. This is, that's what C.S. Lewis calls it. It's a continual glorification of the other. Here's how C.S. Lewis would say. He says, in Christianity, God is not a static thing, but he's a dynamic, pulsating activity. He's a life almost of a kind of drama. Almost, if you won't think of me irreverent, a kind of dance. 
They're overflowing with affection and joy towards one another. Tim Keller says that when you're glorifying something, you find it beautiful for what it is in, it, in, a, in itself. Meaning that true joy biblically is not loving God for his blessings. It's just loving him for him. You don't love the blessings, you love the blesser. So in, in the Trinity, they're glorifying one another. They find this affection towards one another for who they are. So check this out. You tracking with me? It's making sense? Here we go. So John 17, later on in that chapter, this is what Jesus says. He says, Father, you are in me, I am in you, that they also may be in us. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Come on, that should make your heart tremble, that the same intense love that the Father has for his son is the same intense love that he has for you and for me. I'm gonna say it again, because some of you don't believe it. The same love that the Father has for Jesus, he has for you. He's got that for you, that burning desire inside of him burns with love for his son with the same intensity and passion for you. When we're born again, we don't just simply get a get out of jail free card and live our life however we want until that day. No, we're brought into the very shared life, the shared experience of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. That when you wake up in the morning, you're not ordinary. Yeah, you woke up in Southern California, but in truth, come on. In truth, you didn't sleep too good last night. Well, you wake up, I didn't sleep too good, but oh man. I get to enjoy the relationship of the Father, Son, and the Spirit today. And it's not because I did a good job yesterday. Dude, come on. You can't achieve this. You receive this. this. This isn't a location that you achieve through your performance. It's impossible. This is something hands wide open you just fall and surrender to. You just fall your way into the Trinity. You fall your way into that relationship. You're in him, you're in Christ. One of my favorite verses, 1 Corinthians 1.30, says that you are in Christ by God's doing. That's a liberating man. To know that I'm not in Christ by my report card in life. I'm not in Christ because of how others treat me or don't treat me. I'm not in Christ for anything I can do, it's God's doing. He put me there. That's a liberating. Tim Keller says that he created us not to get joy. He already had that, obviously. He created us to give it. Out of the overflow, come on. Out of the overflow of the interior life of God. It was like you could imagine the Father, Son, and the Spirit one day. They're having a conversation in heaven. And they're saying, we've got so much love, so much joy. We're overflowing. I'm ready to give it to something else. Like, there's, there's, is there anything we can do? Can we, can we create something that can become the apple of our eye that we can just pour affection on? And so he dreamed up you. You're not the product of your parents. 
Took you a second to get that. Come on, God dreamed you up. I need a target for my affection. And there you were. I can remember there was this, I think it was around 2016. I was in a season we were starting up. It was either the first or second ministry school we were starting. And anybody ever had like a new job or a new assignment or you're stepping into something that requires a greater level of responsibility and leadership? Anyone ever had that moment where you're kind of like a little overwhelmed, right? Or maybe you're going into college and you're kind of like, man, I was able to just breeze through high school. College is a different beast. My professor doesn't know my name, but I know he doesn't like the way I write. How am I ever going to write this paper, right? You, you, you know, the emotion overwhelmed, like, don't, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I can remember we have all these people, they're, you know, they're wanting to move to California and we don't have a base. We don't have housing for them. So we got to find houses, just all this stuff. And you just kind of, you just can have a moment. If you think about it for too long, you really can get depressed, like real quick, uh, when you look at your insufficiencies. And so um, I just encourage you, don't look at your insufficiencies too often. Uh, it's discouraging. But I had, I had been staring at my insufficiencies a little too long and uh, which I can be prone to do from time to time. And I got discouraged and I got overwhelmed and I got stressed. And how many of you know that when you're overwhelmed and stressed and then I, I'm losing sleep and then all of a sudden kind of, I'm not, I don't normally deal with anxiety, but I started having some anxiety and I'm just like, my mind's wondering, has anyone ever experienced anything like this? Please, I'm not, okay, I'm not alone. Okay, so it was in that that I have a dream. And in the dream, um, I approach a man named Lauren Cunningham. So if you don't know who Lauren Cunningham is, Lauren Cunningham is the founder of YWAM. He's like the father of missions. He is, um, just to look him up, it's unbelievable. I think he's been to every country in the world. Like he is the man, he's the goat of missions. And so in the dream, I'm, I'm so stressed and nervous because I wanna please Lauren because we're starting these ministry schools and I wanna do it the way that he wants us to do it. I wanna meet all the requirements, right? I wanna, I wanna make him look good. I wanna make him proud. And in the dream, I was so stressed. I was asking him question after question of what I was supposed to do. Was I doing it right? Was I doing it good enough? And every time in the dream, I would ask him a question he would have the biggest grin on his face and he would hand me an ice cream sandwich. <laughs> and I remember getting frustrated, so I'd ask him another question and it was like, bam, out of the back pocket, big smile, ice cream sandwich. And it just happened multiple times in the dream and I remember after waking up, I just knew that was the Lord. I knew that was a God dream. And it was like the Lord was saying to me, like he said to Martha, he's like, Zach, you're distracted and worried about many things, but there's one thing necessary. He's like, you've been doing all this stuff, trying to please me instead of doing it with me. I know you're stressed, Zach, I'm not. I know you're overwhelmed. I'm not. I know you feel insufficient. Oh, but I'm not. I know you don't have it all together, but I do. I know you don't see yourself as a leader, but I see you. I know you haven't fully stepped into what all you're going to walk in, but oh, but I see it. I, I wrote the playbook. I wrote the narrative. I, I actually see the end. So I, I framed you, I formed you, I know your days, so trust me, have an ice cream sandwich and enjoy my smile. <laughs> I'm telling you tonight, the Lord wants to hand you an ice cream sandwich. Come on, and you get, you're getting frustrated in your life. You're getting frustrated in your life because you've got all these big questions because you're trying to impress the Lord trying to please him, and he's saying, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. I'm pleased. Some of you right now, you just need to receive it. You've been wrestling. You've been battling. Your emotions got the best of you. Your insufficiencies are, are defining you, and God's saying, hey, 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 
Let my smile define you. Let my affection toward you define you. Can we keep going tonight? The Lord wants to break out. He wants to break free of the preconceived ideas and boxes that we put him in. He does not like being defined by our small-mindedness. He doesn't like being defined by our limitations. He says, you've put me in a religious box and I need out. So he's breaking out tonight. Jesus would get so frustrated at the religious leaders of his day because they didn't understand his mercy. Mercy was not in their vocabulary. He would get so frustrated at them that they would approach him. Luke, you know Luke 15, those parables, right? The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Those weren't just cute stories that Jesus decided to tell a random bunch of people one day. It says that the Pharisees were angry because sinners were eating with Jesus. It says they were angry. And so his response to their anger was to reveal the joy of his father. You're so angry that the sinners are coming to me, but don't you know that the shepherd leaves the 99 for the one and he calls everyone and says, rejoice with me. Oh, it's the woman, she's lost the coin. She's lost the coin in her house, she's sweeping everywhere. She finally finds it. She phones her friends. I'm throwing a party. Come rejoice with me. The lost son goes, squanders everything, comes home, kill the calf. We're feasting tonight. He's the God of rejoicing. You ever thought about it? If you lost, if you lost a $100 bill, you lost it. Can't find it. How much is it worth? Hundred dollars. Well, not a trick question. <laughs> so often when we go down the wrong path or make a wrong mistake, we think our value changes. And then all of a sudden, the happy God has become the angry God once again. I'm breaking your paradigms tonight, I know, but I'm coming at you. Zephaniah 3.17 says that the Lord your God is in your midst. He's a mighty one who will save you. Oh, check this out. He will rejoice over you with gladness. That means he will violently spin and dance over you with affection. Oh, you don't know. You don't know this. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Don't you know there's a joyful song being sung over your life by the Father? He's not ashamed to dance wildly over you. We get timid in worship services. Is anybody watching me? I'm telling you, there, there is no shame in the Father's dance over you. There's no shame in his song over your life. Here's the problem. You and I, we are hardwired for pleasure. We were created with a capacity and a desire for enjoyment, for satisfaction, and fulfillment. We were made for that. Psalm 37, four, you know this verse. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Who's ever had that on, a, on the front of a journal or written on the wall in your, in your room? But here's the issue. Can I tell you the issue? Culture, the, the current narrative of culture is selling the lie twisting the truth, and here's what culture would say. Delight yourself in you. Give yourself the desires of your heart. Culture says the ultimate and central goal of your life is to be happy and feel good about yourself 
And it feeds the lie that the highest good is individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression. And anything that limits, check this out, anything that limits or challenges our personal autonomy or our independence or our being individual, anything that challenge or challenges or limits that is, is rejected. Basically, culture says if this puts you in a box, if you can't do what, you know, follow your heart's desires, reject it. It's oppressing you. You need to be free to make your choices, find your truth, be satisfied in the things you want to be satisfied in. The deception is that if you give individuals maximum freedom in every aspect of their lives, then all will be well. I love how Mark Sayers writes this. He says, what happens is we wish for the kingdom, but we don't want to acknowledge the authority of the king. Basically saying, hey, hey, I want the blessings of the kingdom. I want that righteousness, peace, and joy part, but I don't, I don't want the authority or submission to this man. He says, for at the heart of kingship is the concept of authority. Authority is the surrendering of autonomy, absolute freedom, and free choice to someone else. Self-focused seekers are seeking the pleasure, peace, and joy of the kingdom, thinking that it can be attained without full surrender to the king of that kingdom. Pleasure becomes the end in and of itself. Pleasure becomes the end. So every decision in our life becomes centered around this question. What will bring me the most pleasure? And regardless of who it harms, regardless of the outcome, as long as I receive pleasure, that's all that matters. Come on, let's be honest. That's why, that's why you know, men who've been married for a long time, if they fall into this lie, that's why they, they can, you know, make excuses to go to pornography to find some sense of pleasure, knowing that it's about to destroy their entire family. But what happens is the self-focused seeker makes a decision based not upon what's it going to affect around me, but what kind of pleasure can I get? What kind of pleasure can I get? What happens is that we become enslaved by the wrong appetites. We become enslaved by the wrong appetites. We're hardwired for pleasure, for fulfillment, for satisfaction, for delight, for enjoyment, but we fall for the same trap as Adam and Eve did in the garden, and we allow the deceiver, come on, track with me on this, we allow the deceiver to cause us to question the Lord's goodness, and we reach for things we were never meant to touch. I've said it before, the fall didn't occur when they ate of the tree. The fall occurred when they believed the lie. God's not good. God's not good. God's not for me. Right? The enemy comes in to bring the deception. Oh, did he really say this? You surely die. No. He's, with, he's a withholding father. He just knows that if you eat of that, you'll become like him. And he doesn't want you to become like him because he wants to control you. He wants you to be a little puppet on a string. He's not for you. He's not good. And all of a sudden, we buy the lie and we eat of the tree. And we become self-centered pleasure seekers, enslaved by the wrong appetites. Delight yourself in you and give yourself the desires of your heart. That's not what the psalmist said. Delight yourself in in the Lord. Delight yourself in him so that your desires become shaped and transformed by his desire for you. Delight yourself in him. Hebrews eleven twenty four 24 through 26 says that by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
choosing rather, this is, this is profound, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Fleeting pleasures of sin. Fleeting, temporal, not lasting, no eternal value, harmful. So we have to have, there's got to be a decision in our life where it's either we continue to pursue the fleeting passions and pleasures of sin or we choose the unchanging and unshakable joy of the king. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? But we got to make that decision. I remember, I don't know how many of you, I don't know your stories. I wish I knew everyone's stories, man. I think about that all the time. I wish there was a moment where we could just hear everyone's stories. You got to know it's incredible that God's writing a narrative over your life, man. You got to believe that, that your story isn't just happening to you. God is writing a story in your life. God wrote a story in my life, and I know I went through a season of, pretty intense addiction, and I was seeking, right, when you're addicted to something, whether it's drugs or alcohol or fame or pornography or money or whatever it is, when you're addicted to something, the central motivating factor is the pleasure of that thing, right? Can I get a witness in the room? I'm not the only one who's struggled in, in my life, hopefully. So, but, right, so there's this motivating factor that's driving us when we, in our addictions and our searching for pleasure and I remember coming to the end of myself, literally ready to commit suicide because the fleeting pleasures of sin were just that. They were fleeting. And all of a sudden, I found myself in this hopeless, depressed state where I was like, I'm too far gone. I'm 20, I think I was at the time, 22 years old, completely addicted to opiates, can't get out of bed without drugs, can barely keep my job, can't keep relationships, owe the wrong people money, got just, it's a dead end street. I'm at the end, I got nowhere to go, right? I'm so hopeless and helpless, and I can remember believing the lie, it's better off, Zach, that you are no longer on the planet. So I took around, somewhere around 2,000 milligrams of OxyContin, tried to end my life, so depressed, so broken, so hopeless, woke up in the hospital, and ended up going to this place called Teen Challenge, and it was there, it was in that place when all of a sudden all the distractions and the, and the fleeting pleasures of sin were on the outside and I had to become, come face to face with reality, face to face with myself and face to face with this good God. And I had this moment where I traded my addictions for astonishment. And it was this power of a new affection that drove out the old affections. You don't get rid of a wrong affection in your heart by trying harder. You got to replace it with a stronger affection. I'm going to say that again. You don't get rid of those wrong, misdirected affections of your heart by just willing them away. Try harder, try harder, try harder. No. I had to become astonished with Jesus and that astonishment had to far outweigh my desire for the fleeting pleasures of sin. I'm going to quote John Piper again. He says, we are willing to be God-centered, it seems, as long as God is man-centered. I'm going to read that first line again. We are willing to be God-centered, it seems, as long as God is man-centered. We are willing to boast in the cross as long as the cross is a witness to our worth. Come on, John, he's cutting us deep right now. And then he says, who then is our pride and joy? He says, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness, with all the friends you ever had on earth, and all the food you ever liked, 
and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disaster. Could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? What then is the spirit longing for? What is the desire of the spirit? Jesus teaches us that the Holy Spirit will come into the world, John 16. Jesus says he will come into the world to glorify me. He says earlier in John, he says the spirit will come and he will Take the things of mine and disclose them to you. Saying he will, he will come and reveal me. The longing and the yearning of the spirit is Jesus. It's the adoration and the longing for him. If you could have all of those things, are you satisfied in heaven if Christ is not there? Our flesh glories and glorifies and adores and yearns for all kinds of created things and conditions and people, but the Spirit glorifies and adores and yearns for Jesus. The Spirit speaks of the beauty and the greatness of Christ. Therefore, the Spirit then is longing to show you and me Christ to conform us to Christ. The yearning of the Spirit is to reveal the Son to us, to cause our entire being to stand in attention at Him. As the Spirit begins to reveal Jesus to you and to me, it's the affection of our heart begins to outweigh every lesser lover. And what we find is that Jesus is the most fascinating and wonder-filled person to ever walk the face of the earth. Our new affection drives out the old and we become ecstatic because we see him. J.I. Packer writes, what's the best thing in life bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? It's the knowledge of God. That's why Paul prayed for us. He said, I pray that you would give them, grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He didn't stop the sentence there. In the knowledge of him. John 15 tells, Jesus tells us his desire, which is the desire of the spirit, is that his joy would be in us and our joy would be full, overflowing joy not fleeting, not changing, not fickle, overflowing joy. Michael Reeves says, to encounter the living, holy, and all, and all gracious God truly means that we cannot contain ourselves. He's not a truth to be known unaffectedly. Oh, He's not a truth to be known unaffectedly. That means your quiet times in the scriptures, your heart should start burning. When you read about Jesus, your heart should burst. It should affect every fiber of your being. He's not a truth to be known unaffectedly or a good to be received listlessly. Seen clearly, the dazzling beauty and splendor of God must cause our hearts to quake. This is really fascinating. In his book, Michael Reeves' book on the fear of the Lord, which is called Rejoice and Tremble, he says that there was recent scientific studies done that confirmed the benefits of having awe, A-W-E, awe-filled experiences. As in 2008, this study showed that the experiences of awe that we have produce in us a humility. They found that when individuals encounter an entity that is vast and challenges their worldview, they feel awe. 
which leads to a subsequent state of humility. Another set of studies sought to demonstrate the impact of awe on well-being and stress-related symptoms. The authors found that for every participant in the study, after they would have one of these awe-filled experiences, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder decreased, while scores of general happiness, satisfaction with life, and social well-being all improved. It actually stated in this study that there was a massive effect on emotions and in um, autoimmune diseases and immune issues. Heart disease was affected. Researchers found that awe was the emotion that most likely lowered the levels of the molecules that were causing these issues. Now, I don't know what they used in that study, maybe mountains, maybe massive trees, maybe beautiful landscapes. If that can, if those images and those views can have an, that kind of effect on the, on the human frame, what happens to the soul when it sees Jesus rightly? What happens to your life when you begin to realize what he's actually like, that he's the happy God? What happens when you begin to realize that, oh man, maybe I've been loving him for the blessings, not just because he's a blesser, not just because he is who he is. I'm sure many of you are asking the question, well, Zach, this is amazing, but what about when I don't feel it and everything is going wrong in my life? I love this. This, is, this sounds amazing and true, and I want that, but my life is hard. My relationships are, are tough. My family life is challenging. My job, you don't get my job. You don't understand my boss. You don't understand the environment I got to work in just to pay the bills. My bank account's low. My bills are high. I love your, your message, but what about all of that? This is where you and I have to move out of the prosperity gospel mindset. This says, just because I gave my life to Jesus that everything around me is gonna change for the better. He doesn't promise that to you and I. Life will still be hard. But the delight in God, true joy, the source is simply and solely based upon how worthy and beautiful he is. It's got to be true because in Acts 5 verse 40, it says they called the, the apostles, they called them in and they beat them and they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. It says they left the presence of the council with their head, hand, uh, with their head hanging down it's not what it says. They left the presence of the council depressed. That's not what it says. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. What has driven Christians throughout the ages? Think about the early church. They were led to their death in the Colosseum. They were martyred and yet they refused to deny Jesus and they willingly and joyfully went to be burned at the stake. How is that possible? Could it be that they have seen him? Could it be that their eyes have seen the nail pierced hands, the scars in his side and they were glad, they were exuberant. It speaks of the early bishops in the early church. And it says none of them would have taken on their role for sheer status. They knew they were the ones to be killed, but they would take that role on anyways. There was something deep in their soul that drove them. I want to suggest to you tonight that it's the eternal hope of Jesus that flooded their soul. Can you stand with me? I'm gonna read a couple of these verses 
I'm going to pray for you. I believe tonight the Lord is going to mark your heart. Come on, I'm telling you, lean into this. The eternal hope of Jesus flooded their soul. Listen to this. Listen carefully to these verses. Revelation 21, 3 through 5. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Life may be hard, but there is coming a day. Every tear will be wiped away. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Revelation 21, 22 to 23. I saw no temple in this city, this new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. There was no temple for its temple is the Lord, God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the Lamb. He's saying there is no need for an exterior light. The radiance and the beauty of the Lamb will shine. His radiance will flood the atmosphere. You've heard it said, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I want to tell you tonight that if heaven has not filled your mind, you will be of no use in this earth. I'm going to read C.S. Lewis to you again. He says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is, since Christian, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at the earth and you will get neither. You and I have to give up the questions about how and when he will return. You can get caught up in debate after debate after debate and be an armchair theologian the rest of your life and argue in the comments, or you can be infused and overcome with hope saying, I put up the question mark. I don't know when or how he's coming, but I know he's coming and there will be a day when every tear is wiped away. There will be a moment when we won't need the sun, we won't need the moon, the lamp will be the lamb. His radiance will fill the atmosphere. I know you're going through something challenging. I know you're going through trials. I know things are difficult, but I'm telling you there's a joy that circumstances can't touch and it's the, it's the soul that's been pierced by the lamb. It's a soul that's seen him. And all of a sudden, no demon in hell can steal the joy from your life because you can say, oh, I've seen him. I've seen him. The lamb will be the centerpiece. So as we are about to go back into worship and I'm gonna pray for you, I wanna tell you some things I do know that are true regardless of what you're going through, that are true regardless of how you feel. And I'm going to speak to your spirit, and I want you to receive these. Before Jesus, if you're a born-again believer in the room, I'm speaking to you. If you're not a born-again believer, this can be your story. For the born-again believer, before you were born again, this is you. You were spiritually dead, Ephesians 2. You were ungodly, Romans 5. 
You were without strength, Romans 5. You had no relationship with God, Ephesians 2. You were without Christ, Ephesians 2. You were condemned, Romans 3. You were guilty, Ephesians 2. You were a child of wrath. You were darkness. You were banished. You were under the power of sin. You were separated from God, Genesis 3. You were dead in trespasses and sin. You were a sinner. You were an enemy of God. You had no mercy. You had no hope. You had no peace. But now that you are in him, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you're feeling, regardless of what your friends or parents or people in your life have said about you, regardless of all the negative experiences added up together, regardless of all of that, the greater truth is what I'm about to tell you. Now that you are in him, you are spiritually alive. You are holy priests. You are kept by the power of God. You are heirs and joint heirs. You are in Christ. You are justified. You are pardoned. You are a child of God. You are light. You are accepted. You are freed from the power of sin. You are joined to God. You are made alive in Christ. You are a saint. You are reconciled. You now have mercy. You now have hope and peace. You now are blameless. You're faultless. You're without spot or blemish. You're his beloved. You're adopted. You're a a friend. You're his favorite. You're redeemed. Come on, you need to receive this tonight. I want you to lift your hands to heaven. I'm gonna pray for you. I believe right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is going to impart a joy, a supernatural joy into your soul, not because you've achieved it, but because he's achieved it on your behalf, because he is forever for you, because he is forever good. So Holy Spirit, right now, in the name of King Jesus, I pray that you, would fill them with joy, with hope overflowing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would abound in hope. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray right now for the weight and the heaviness of depression. I pray in Jesus' name, let those chains begin to fall. By the power of the Holy Spirit, if you've been weighed down, come on, with anxiety, crippling depression, life hasn't turned out how you thought, I'm telling you the Lamb is your eternal reward. The Lamb has His eyes on you. The Father is dancing and singing a song of victory over your life. I'm prophesying to you tonight that God is winning in your life. God is winning in your life. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Let his face, let his smile shine down on you in Jesus' name. Tonight, some of you have, you you know that you have given way to the fleeting pleasures of sin. You've been longing for desire. You've been longing for, for, for fulfillment. You've been looking in all these places and you're sick, you're tired, you're weary, you're so busted for this longing. If that's you, I wanna invite you, come forward. Tonight, we're gonna worship King Jesus. We're gonna stare at him tonight and I'm telling you, that your soul is gonna get marked. If you need a fresh revelation of Jesus tonight, if you need a fresh infilling of joy, if you want your soul to be marked by him, then I wanna invite you to crowd the front. We're gonna worship King Jesus tonight and we're gonna pour out our affection on him. I wanna invite you to engage with the Lord. I want you just to begin all across the room. Just begin to set your affection on him. Begin to lift your hands. Begin to tell him he's beautiful. Come on, begin to tell him that he's worthy. Begin to ask him to reveal himself to you. Begin to tell him that you don't just want his blessings, you want him. Tell him tonight that you want to be captivated by a vision of King Jesus. You don't want the joy of the temporal. You want the joy which is Jesus. Come on, all across the room, just begin to lift your voice. Just begin, set your affection on him. Look at him, look at the lamb. Oh, the beautiful, radiant lamb, we worship you, Jesus. We want the
with the joy that comes from your heart. We want to experience tonight the smile of the Father. We're done striving. We're done performing. Come on, tell him you're done striving for his affection. You're done trying to perform for his joy. Receive his joy tonight. In Jesus' name. Receive his joy tonight. In Jesus' name. Come on, we're going to worship.